good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, it's a uh, great pleasure and great honor to welcome you at the uh, third uh, Startup Grind uh, uh, evening. And uh, we are very grateful for uh, Vilnius uh, Tech Park uh, for hosting uh, our events. Now, uh, Startup Grind operates uh, uh, nearly 200 uh, chapters, one of the latest uh, being Vilnius. So we're really happy about that, uh, that uh, we put uh, uh, Lithuania and, and Vilnius on yet another, another map, yet another pin in, in, in global map. Uh, so uh, Startup Grind is uh, aiming uh, to uh, educate and inspire uh, uh, startup people uh, around the world. So, uh, uh, and, and they're doing so by organizing discussions just like we have one today. So uh, it's uh, without uh, other introductions. Uh, let me uh, uh, congratulate uh, Andrus Limas, who is uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Oberlo. Uh, so uh, give a, let's give a nice round of applause, everybody. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, always a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, um, I'm very happy to share the story of Oberlo and uh, a little, a few more stories that were before Oberlo. So, um, yeah, happy to be here and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, so um, we'll have uh, approximately one hour discussion uh, here, here on stage and uh, then you, ha you will have uh, opportunity to uh, ask uh, any questions that, uh, that you have. So please, uh, please prepare your questions. There's going to be a, a stage for that uh, just in, uh, in one hour. So, um, Andrus, uh, now Oberlo is, uh, you know, um, how to say, uh, abandoning the stealth mode and uh, we, we, we start uh, hearing uh, things, uh, things about uh, Oberlo and, uh, and its success. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, it took you quite a few years uh, to get uh, up to this uh, success. Uh, tell us about your start. Uh, so maybe uh, first business ventures. Uh, how, how did it start? Uh, how did you come up with, the, with these ideas yeah, uh, sure. that, that you did? Okay, so it, it, it did take us uh, around 10 years, actually eight years to become, to see the first success. So for basically the first eight years, we were not, um, I wouldn't say we saw any, any kind of success. We were doing lots of things, but uh, nothing that you, you, you would consider a success, uh, as a success. And um, I think during these first eight years, um, it was, uh, I think there were many times when we thought, you know, it's all over. It's like we have to quit, and, and it's not not going to happen. But uh, I don't know. I could uh, probably start, you know, very briefly about my hist uh, about my my uh, you know the first encounters with business. So my father was a was a, like a traditional businessman. So he was going to Verune, uh, buying stuff uh, cheaper and selling for. Uh, you know, for a higher price. So that was a very basic understanding of the business. Uh, and at that time, no one were really talking about like giving any value or thinking about creating the value. So my, my first encounter with business was, you know, that business is sort of buying low and selling high. Um, so I, I was doing this with him in the very beginning. Um, so I would take to, I would go to uh, Kona's meat market and uh, I was very young, like 10 years or 12 years, and I was selling uh, calculators for the butchers, if that's the, the name, butchers. Yeah, butcher. yeah um, because they were like always in a rush and they were breaking those calculators like every week, so I could make like 100 litres every week. Uh, so that was my, uh, my first start of uh, earning money through selling stuff. Um, and I don't know, for some reason, I was always thinking that, like, uh, you know, I'm going to be a businessman and, like, I, I'm never going to be, you know, um, working anywhere. And, uh, and again, the, the businessman that I have imagined at that time was selling, uh, you know, selling uh, something that you bought for, for a low price, you know. Um, 
and, and never about the creating value or, or, or what the startups actually do. Um, yeah, so I came to Vilnius to study. I studied business management in Vilnius Gedminas Technical University, and uh, I didn't like the study so much that I, I, I started doing business the, the first year. So my first business was e-commerce business, and I was selling books. So the things that they wrote uh, about me on, on the description of the start of this event, that I was using trolleybus to deliver books. So I had this argue with my wife, and she said that no, like you you were not doing this because you had the car, but I had the car and I sold it to to, to buy you know things for my e-commerce business. So I didn't have a car, and I did take um, I, I did deliver the first items in the first e-commerce business that I had in the trolley buses. I was taking you know I couldn't afford like uh, you know delivering with a car. So it was a, a um, 2005. Uh, where but but uh, what was that? Uh, did you have uh, some uh, e-shop uh, running live? Yeah, so that was the times when you when we had I think like two stores in Lithuania, and I was fascinated with with the e-commerce business, and um, so I, I was eager to start it. But you didn't have like online payments, so you you just like send by email the the instruction how to do the bank transfer. Uh, so that's how it worked, uh, and then you didn't have like a very convenient way of, you know, delivering the items. So that's why I was using trolley buses or bus for public transportation. Um, yeah. So um, so that's how it all started. I didn't make any money, and then the things that were it was the secondhand bookstore. So it was the, the first second uh, secondhand bookstore in Lithuania. So we were, uh, or I was, uh, selling the books that I owned, and it was my first. You know, first encounter with e-commerce. So interesting story is that um, I didn't have money to. Uh, are, are we losing the sound somehow? No. I think it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't have money to like go to the agency and ask them to do an e-commerce store, and there were not like online solutions for e-commerce. So I couldn't like go and open an account uh, with Shopify or something like this. So I had to go to an agency and and um, I had to go to an agency and pay them money, but I didn't have money, so I learned how to write code and how to program. Now we're losing, right? <laughs> so I, I learned how to do. Uh, I learned how to do. I, I learned how to write code, and I started programming. And then, uh, you know, a friend of mine asked me to do a website for him, so I did the website. And then the other guy asked me to do a website, and I did the the second website. And I somehow moved from this e-commerce, e which wasn't working. Uh, and I moved to uh, like software or website development yeah. business, and, and at that time we started um, a, a small web agency that, that that I worked for six months uh, for six years with that. So uh, you started the agency in what year? Ooh, I think it was 2006, 2007, around that time. <clears throat> yes, uh, but. In that period, I was working with uh, with this up, with, uh, with this web agency because it was generating us money. But I was always obsessed with e-commerce, so I, I did the secondhand bookstore first, and it didn't fly. So I then found suppliers in China, and it was again like 2006, 2007. And then I, I think that was the time that I sold my car, and then I bought a lot of ties from China, which took I had thousand one thousand ties in my storage. Still? Yeah, still. So because I sold, I think, two or three, <laughs> so it wasn't like the best start, but uh, I, I enjoyed the process. So yeah, so I, I sold the car, borrowed money, and well, uh, I got one co-founder involved because I needed a lot of money. Uh, yeah, and we, we bought all sorts of things in China, and especially ties and cufflinks, and uh, I all have it um, in, in the storage. So that was the second thing. Um, yeah, then, um, so at all times the, the web agency was running. So it was the third e-commerce business with my brother. He, he came to Vilnius and then we started um, an e-commerce business for uh, sort of interior design stuff. Uh, so I don't, like, I don't recall a single order there, maybe one. <laughs> And um, for some reason, like I was so keen on doing this, and it never, it never stopped. It, 
like I always see the same result, but I still get excited doing like an, yet another venture, uh, an e-commerce business, because it, it, I don't know, I just like the process of building everything. But um, there, uh, you know, the, the the problem was that we were sort of con repeating our mistakes again and again. We were we would build the perfect thing, the the perfect e-commerce store, but we never thought about like user acquisition part. And we thought that you know the product is so wonderful, like everyone will be rushing and buying the things online, but like in reality, no one ever did that. So it was e-commerce then. I remembered like I had this wonderful, you know, secondhand bookstore. Let's have like a new bookstore. So we opened the yet uh, fourth e-commerce platform, which was bookstore. So we did have a few orders there. It was like the best, the most successful, but still nothing <laughs> compared to what you imagine business do. Um, then. Um, and again, you know, all, all of these business, I think now this is the important part. With all these businesses, we were spending a lot of time, a lot of efforts, a lot of money on delivering, on creating that product or on creating that e-commerce platform. Uh, usually like, I don't know, half a year and finding the suppliers and, um, you know, renting an office and, and getting the products and then, you know, think, getting the agreements, the, the contracts with delivery companies and everything. Um, payment providers, all, all sorts of things, and then after like half a year, we launch it, and then no one really needs it, and no one really cares about the product. And then the fifth thing was um, uh, it was a clo clothing store, so for for um, basically for for gamers, for men uh, themed clothes. And uh, so we thought that you know we not we are not gonna go the same path and we're not gonna like create it for um, you know half a year and then launch it. We had this call with my brother Saturday Saturday morning and uh, on Sunday evening we had the store ready and we didn't have products. It's uh, also important thing. We didn't have products. We didn't have suppliers for the products. So we thought you know we'll just like you know start selling because we found these products on the internet. And like, if someone buys it, then you know we'll find the supplier, uh, because we thought it's a lean way to test out the, the if if it works. And then we did that, and on the first day we got four thousand dollars in sales. It was like way way more than we received collectively in all the previous e-commerce businesses. And then from that day it took off. So in the in the first in the first year, actually after uh, after a year we sold the business, but in the first year we made three point five million dollars in sales so it was a very uh, you know like a, an eye-opening thing how you should create products and, and, and businesses and how you really have to test out the you know your assumptions and the demand in the market and everything so that was the first um, you know taste of success and it was like after maybe after eight years of a lot of failures and uh, and then this this web agency that we didn't really like uh, yeah, so it was, I guess, the first yeah, taste of success, I would say. But uh, eight years, uh, when I think about it, it's like really huge amount of time and uh, um, all the chances to lose, uh, to lose motivation, to lose faith in oneself and uh, uh, drop everything and start doing whatever else or maybe just going uh, and working for somebody. Uh, how did you find the, the, the strength, the motivation to, to, to go on? I think you have to be a little bit, you know, messed up in, in your head. <laughs> because it's a, it, it doesn't make much sense if you're like, if you're a failure for eight years, why would you think that you would, won't be a failure for like another eight years? But for some reason, I, I always got so excited and then, um, it, like, I always forget it. And then I would go to my wife and say, like, oh, my God, this, is, this time is going to be, like, crazy. And she said, like, no, but you were saying the same thing, the same exact thing for, like, the last, you know, six, eight years. And, and, I, and I would think that, you know, she's so right. Like, I always feel that, you know, it, this is, like, the, the one, the idea, the good, the, the, um, you know, the thing that will work uh, at this time. So it was, um, I think at, at points it was difficult, especially at the very, um, at the end of this failure period before the, this e-commerce business took off, uh, we were financially 
pretty messed up because I had a lot of debt in, 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 uh, in uh, this web agency. Uh, we had a few clients that were causing us problems. Then uh, we started losing uh, employees and um, so it wasn't a good, it wasn't good time, but probably, you know, it was, a, it, it was a wise decision not to stop because you never know, you know, when you really succeed. You, you, you know, if you stop today, maybe tomorrow or in a week time, you're going to be a very successful, you know, person. And, and it's, I think it's all the coincidences. So the more you do, the, the more, the longer you do and the more times you do that, the, you just increase the, the chances of succeeding. So I guess that's what we were doing, uh, you know, with the team and with my brother, with everyone. Um, yeah. So uh, the, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I believe uh, now uh, Oberlaw enters the stage, right? Uh, after after this. Not uh, quite, right? Not quite. <laughs> so um, so when we got when we finally started earning money with this e-commerce business, uh, we thought that okay, so we have to close this web agency we finally can afford that because before that we couldn't just like stop you know stop working with the clients because we, we still had to pay salaries so we couldn't stop by that time we had enough money to say that okay so that these these clients that we have they are the last ones we're going to take the uh, the whole company not the whole but the majority of our team that we're working in the web agency we're going to put everyone on on the startup because you know startup is cool and it's something that you know you're building the product you're not working on projects that are just coming and going so we um, so we sort of closed the agency and started the first startup Iselio it was a, an e-commerce platform for for sort of a micro e-commerce platform where where you would get one page store or you could get like a snippet for your product that you can embed in, in, in your blogs or you could um, you know paste the share those products on on your social media so um, the, the problem with that startup was that we did exactly the same thing that we were doing with all of the e-commerce businesses. So we, you know, we spent a lot of money and a lot of time. We spent a lot, uh, I think, around one hundred thousand euros, in, uh, and spent one year without showing a product to a single client. So we made it perfect, and we thought we thought that it's like never good enough to. You know to launch it because like you know we we still need a feature this is not like super nice and uh, and we were sort of postponing everything and then after a year after spending 100,000 euros we launched it and uh, just to learn that like no one really cared about the product and we earned 40 cents uh, after, after launching it so I was like trying to keep the morale of the of the team but we we were not like we were not we were sort of protecting each other, so we were smiling and saying like, "Yeah, it's gonna be fine." But it was not nothing fine about that thing. Like, <laughs> it was like the end. Uh, and by that time, we sold our e-commerce business. Uh, so like, we didn't have anything to do. With the, we had the startup, which was not working. We had the team, which was like super upset <laughs> with what just happened, and we had uh, you know uh, uh, an e-commerce. Store which was just sold and we didn't have it. Uh, we didn't have it. Uh, and then uh, again, a very interesting turn in, in, in the whole story it happened that we had a month left of money in the bank account in the Cicelio startup bank account, and we thought, okay, so we have like a month of you know time to do something, and like let's create like a, a very tiny apps, throw it into the market. And you know, and if something happens, if someone starts using these apps, we will come back. So we created three apps in in a month time, um, and we launched it. And then the guys, the the other co-founders, went working, you know, for, uh, with some contracts for other other companies. And uh, well, interestingly enough, all of these uh, all of these apps uh, started generating a lot of not a lot of but quite a, well a lot of money, <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we, we, we talked and we said like, wow, this is crazy. We have to come back because, uh, you know, these apps that we did in a few weeks, they are making so much money, so much more money than uh, compared to... To the uh, 40 cents. Yeah, to the 40 cents that we did and, 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 and a year of work. So really like, it like, oh, finally confirmed my point of view that you really have to test out. And, and I think LinkedIn co-founders say that when you launch a product, you should be ashamed of it. 
So I, I, I really like this idea that you, when you launch it, it, it has to do one tiny thing in, a, you know, in an efficient way, it has to solve one problem, and if it solves the problem, then you, it's going to find their customers, its customers. And if not, then you, know, you can be perfecting it to whatever it takes, but it's, it's not, it's not going to happen. So I think that's when Averlo started. And Averlo was the, 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 the most successful uh, of these free apps. So um, initially it was just a tiny app which was importing products from AliExpress. And then with the time we really grew the product and, and the team and everything. Yeah, so that's when Averlo started, before yet another failure. Okay, um, do I hear right that uh your brother was uh, co-founder at the most of the ventures, uh, at least to the Oberlo, that's true? Yeah, yeah, well, when I started my first e-commerce business, he was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it, yeah, so it wasn't, he was not involved in the first, in the first um, e-commerce, ex you know, explorations. And actually, he, he was a, a bit of, I don't know, a punk or, or how do you call this? So he had his, all his strange ideas. He, um, at some point he thought that he's gonna be studying theology. Theology, yeah, theology. Yeah, theology. <laughs> then he changed his mind and then he thought that he would go for uh, ethnography. Ethnography? Ethnography. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, man. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I, well, I think I managed to change his mind, or, or it happened, that, you know, naturally. Uh, he grew up and then he thought that maybe there are more interesting things to do in life. And then he came to Vilnius and he started studying uh, politics and economy. And he said that, like, you know, I'm planning to start this e-commerce business with my, like, classmate. And I thought, like, yeah, I'm the man to talk about e-commerce. Like, <laughs> let's do a business together. So that's when I got him involved in, in one of the e-commerce businesses. And then we were uh, doing everything together. So I think it was three projects and then the, the successful one, or two projects, and then the successful one. And then he was involved in, um, in, um, in the failed startup. And now he's uh, a mark our chief marketing officer at the Brello. And uh, we also had uh, a marketing agency with him. So it was... I don't want to go into all these details because you will fall asleep, but there were a lot of things that were happening before Berlo, a lot of failed things. Okay, so just uh, please, uh, please tell us about uh, how you managed uh, uh, to stay friends and stay together uh, through these uh, eight years of uh, downhill, uh, unsuccessful uh, businesses. You mean stay together with my brother? Yeah. Okay. I mean, because well, uh, well, well, I see how uh, you know uh, in in businesses that don't go too well, uh, it's uh, not before too long that partners uh, might begin accusing one each other and uh, um, you know uh, demonstrating this uh, this inappropriate kind of behavior and uh, and just like uh, becoming uh, enemies. Yeah. Um, so, like well, quite a few times, so uh, uh, you know, going through uh, hard times uh, and and still uh, still uh, being together is a, is a big achievement, I would say. Yeah, well, uh, I, I'm also wondering like how we managed to stay with everyone, like with the team, <laughs> because uh, with the Oberlo co-founders, we've been working for you know five to eight years together. So we were from the very beginning, from the first web agency that we started so we were working with them and then you know with my brother and then of course uh, you know the uh, family wife you know it's not always easy when you're you know always uh, when you're sort of hitting the the, 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 the downfall in, in in your career so it's um, I think it was tough but I would say that you know you start you start having all these problems when you probably are successful and then you, you then you know the e ego starts playing in other things if you're not if you don't have like a thing you know to to be arguing about like if you're not talking about you know money or, or, or prestige or anything like that then I don't think that there is enough space for these arguments to appear so uh, we always you know always very 
like full-heartedly believed in the ideas that we were doing and then once they failed we were all upset that you know that happened and you know we couldn't do anything so we were, we were sort of supporting each other through the way and I think it was very very important uh, you know that I had my brother um, to go through all these difficult uh, times and the, and the rest of the founders uh, and the rest of the team so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that you know they, the, the, the team didn't like leave us or, or didn't go somewhere else some of them did but uh, but the core of the team still stayed and I think that was important because they sort of stick we all stick together uh, through during the hard times and now I think we are we are you know pretty happy to be working together okay so um, uh, here we arrive at the Oberlo yeah so please uh, tell us uh, a couple of words about uh, what is it? Uh, so what's, what's this magic service uh, that attracted uh, such attraction? Yeah, so it is really a magical thing. It solves, it makes the e-commerce possible. So if you are, um, if you are an e-commerce owner, you go to Oberlo, it's a marketplace, and you have a catalog of products, and then you can choose whatever product you want to sell from tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of products, and you can start selling these products without having it or without having a need to buy these products in advance. So you sort of say, okay, today I'm going to be selling uh, these tables. And if they're not, you know, if, you, if they don't sell, then you, don't, then you can switch chairs or you can switch to, I don't know, iPhone cases or whatever you want. So that means that you don't have to pay any money in advance. You don't worry about, you know, uh, renting a warehouse getting employees, uh, because all the shipments are done by your suppliers, so you don't have to worry about anything. It's sort of like, uh, like downloading uh, an iPhone app, that's, that's, uh, that's all it takes. So it's, uh, it's a very re uh, revolutionary way of doing e-commerce because, you know, it, like if you think about 10 years ago, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't go online and open a store, uh, you, you would have to like hire programmers or, or do some sort of developing, uh, you know, find hosting services and everything. So it would take you money and take you time. Now it doesn't take you money and take you time. It takes you like 20 minutes to open Shopify or a big commerce account and that's it. 10 years ago, it was more difficult with, uh, with marketing because, you know, you would go more traditional ways. The, di the, 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 the digital marketing was sort of just emerging. And now you can like within 20 or, you know, 30 minutes starts your small ad, ad campaigns uh, pretty, Conveniently, uh, with a small budget, start experimenting. You can, you know, attract the 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 traffic to your to your e-commerce business. So we sort of have where to sell the things, and you have some traffic. But the problem is that you don't have what to sell. You don't have products, and if you want to have products, the, you know, the traditional way is that you have to go and buy these products, and you know, wait uh, for the shipment, and then you store these products. And if if it fails, then you have you know a thousand dice in your warehouse, in your um, garage, yeah, garage of storage. Um, so, it, like, it doesn't work. It's it's the last part in e-commerce that is not optimal, and that cannot, you know, that holds you from opening an e-commerce store in in minutes. Now, when we appeared in the market, and we, and we were sort of the one of the first solutions for that, anyone could have a running e-commerce store in a day, or in an hour, or in two hours. And if it, if it doesn't work, then you can have another e-commerce store in, in another hour. And, um, you know, if you don't sell anything, you don't lose anything. And you, you, you get free trials for Shopify, for Verlo. You don't have to pay for products. So it's a very, very convenient way for, the, for entrepreneurs uh, to start their, their online business. On the other hand, we have suppliers. So let's, you know, imagine small manufacturers, boutique manufacturers here in, uh, let's say, in Lithuania. So they know how to produce the product, but they don't know how to sell the product. So they can put that product on our marketplace, and that product like instantly becomes available for tens of thousands of e-commerce stores all around the world. So that means that you know you're basically connecting people who know uh, how to produce products with people who know how to sell products, and uh, they don't have to care about the you know the other part. Uh, I don't have to care about products. You don't have to care about distribution. Uh, so we we created the solution, and from the very beginning, it, it really solved the fundamental problem uh, in e-commerce, 
which was holding the whole e-commerce progress from the very beginning. And, uh, and, uh, and the traction that we had it really showed that you know, the, the market needed it. And, and now we see the competitors and we see a lot of people talking. We have you know, articles and forums and other publications. We have a lot of uh, you know, interest uh, from around the um, you know, media. And we have interest from, we, have, we are partnering with Shopify and we have you know, them come and visit us. It's a $4 billion company and they're like vice president is coming here to Lithuania in a month. So it's a, it's a huge, huge traction which we couldn't like anticipate. We, we did know that it solves a problem, but we, didn't, we couldn't imagine how big that problem was and, uh, and how well this, the solutions got adopted. So, um, yeah, so that, that's in a nutshell what, what uh, Alberto does. Okay, so uh, just uh, when, once again, how did you come up with this idea? Uh, was, that was uh, one of the three apps that you made in, uh, for, for, for this remaining yeah. month for the, for the agency. Yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, we, that's what we did with the, with the original founding team of Iselio, uh, because we had, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a month of, of cash in the bank account. Um, so we had these four, uh, we, these three ideas, uh, we used these three ideas in, in uh, the previous e-commerce business, the business that we sold. So um, all these three apps were sort of scripts that did the same thing, the same automation for ourselves. And then, uh, you know, we sold that business. So we had the, these, uh, these basic scripts or ideas. And then we had the team, which could make it into a product, into a small product, and then we launched it. And then, you know, that's... That's basically how we uh, how we came up with the uh, with the ideas for that. It was something that we used for ourselves in the very beginning. So basically, what what I'm hearing is that uh, uh, you need uh, years and years of experience uh, to come up with uh, with a solution that uh, really solves uh, some of the problem in the field. I think. Um, I mean. This is sort of. I think this is a game of like opportunity spotting. So you are, you know, we all see a lot of things that are inefficient or or doesn't work the way we want. And then you, if you are in the startups business, you are always looking for the things, and you always come up with the ideas that that you know that doesn't work for you, and you could optimize. Um, so it, exactly the same thing happened, you know, uh, with us. So my brother said that you know our our landing page for the e-commerce business, it takes like, you know, a lot of time, a, a long period of time to load. And then I checked that the landing page was uh, like 10 megabytes or something like this. So I wrote the script, which downloads all the product catalog and images and then shrinks the images and re-uploads it. So we saved like, I don't know, like 80% of the bandwidth. Um, so we had this, you know, with this problem, we created a solution and then the solution became a, a tiny product which is still active and uh, used and generating revenue and, and loved by the customers. And then exactly the same thing happened with the other, uh, with the other apps. Uh, so I think it's very much uh, spotting the opportunities and, 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 and problems and thinking about the ways to solve it. Okay, so let's uh, come back to the uh, present day overload. Uh, what are your main challenges uh, now? Okay, so I think the, the, it's, a, it's a nice challenge, but the, the challenge that we had from the very beginning was the growth. Uh, because w when you're growing at this pace, that means like everything is like, you know, changing every like two weeks. So, it, so the things that we're working, the marketing channels, you know, the, the uh, operational issues, the, the, the communication. We, uh, for, the, for the first six months, we had just the founding team, so it was five people, and then in the last six months we grew to over 20 people in, in two locations. Um, so th that's, a lot of, that's a lot of things. I was pretty surprised that one of our employees, uh, actually not one, but <laughs> quite a few of our employees, they didn't know that we have these other apps. So I was like, this is really messed up. <laughs> like, people don't even know how many apps we are, we've created. So uh, I think you know communication is one thing. Then alignment that you know people understand why they are doing the things, and you have a lot of you know people appearing in the company, and 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 all of a sudden you don't even know. I mean, I, I know, but maybe in the very beginning, some some of the existing employees don't know the newcomers' names. So 
you know that's that's uh, that's another thing. Then how you manage the the financial stuff. There are you know money hitting your bank account, and you have to be you know you have to be expanding the operations in the same base. But if you're expanding operations, and for some reason uh, for some reason the, you have cash flows problems or something ha wrong happens, then you know what what do you say to these guys? So. Um, like everything, everything was new to us, and uh, the experience that we collected was very, like, very, you know, domestic, and uh, you couldn't. It, it doesn't apply to the team of ten, and then it doesn't apply to the team of twenty, and it doesn't apply, uh, you know, to a team that is distributed in, in two locations, um, and then, yeah. So um, I think like we we just say that we don't know a thing, and it helps us. The more we admit that we don't know anything, the, the more it helps us to be, you know, looking for ways to solve the, um, to solve these problems, looking for ways for solutions, asking for advices, meeting people. Um, I think I think it's a, it's a good it's a good way not to say that okay, like uh, I'm gonna deal with it. I know everything, but it's 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 not. We we have we never been here. I don't think a lot of people in Lithuania have been to such a place um, in a startup. Like a uh, hockey stick growth? Um, it's, it's not... Um, what, what do you mean about uh, a perfect? Situation? It's not a perfect hockey stick growth, but it's like... Um, yeah, it's sort of 45 degrees growth, maybe a bit steeper. Yeah, but it, it is... It's pretty intensive. I mean, the... Yeah, the, the user base is growing, the revenues are growing pretty fast. Um, over 40% in the last two months monthly, so you know, like we did, yeah, well, 40% that's still a lot, and um, yeah, so it, it is. I think everything is sort of going, it, it's not hockey stick, but it's I would say 45 degrees, everything the team uh, size, the, the revenues, the, the, the user base, everything. So, this growth basically. Uh Challenges you on on people issues um, yeah. mainly is, is that what I hear? Yeah, this is um, very much an issue because you have to be you know you have to be growing at that pace, so that means that you know hiring takes a lot of your time, and uh, the most important thing is that you have to be growing wisely. So you don't you, you, you don't need to just like hire you, you can't just hire people just random people. You have to think about building the culture and uh, at some point we realized that like wow you, I mean we have all sorts of people working here and and all sorts of approaches and we realized that you know we don't have like the Berlo approach so we started working on on, on the team culture and, and, and become pretty strict about it um, so um, it's unfortunate but we already had a few guys leaving uh, the company because you know because their approach to the, to the thing and our approach to the thing was a bit different and uh, so uh, yeah very much uh, I think like the majority of the problems is these are these operational problems that we didn't know we can't manage the people we can't align them we can't give them the reason we can't share the responsibilities we are not sure about the like compensation about when to hire we are always lacking with the resources and it's like the complete mess and I was I was so frustrated that I thought like Crap! I, like we have to stop. We we shouldn't like continue and do anything. We have to stop until we fix it because we're gonna like run into a wall. And then we have um, uh, uh, one guy, uh, a friend of our, of our team, Carlos. He was chief product officer at Skyscanner, and he came to um, to Vilnius and he said, "Like, are you kidding? Like every company in every stage has the same mess, and it's it's not." gonna go away and you have to like you know tolerate some you know some chaos here and then you just have to focus on the on the good things so don't worry like it's gonna go worse <laughs> and it and it does like um, it, it just gets worse but I think you have to tolerate a little bit of uh, um, of this chaos yeah, I think uh, my my experience is, uh, is uh, exactly the, the same that uh, uh, as the business increases, the the chaos increases, and uh, uh, your 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 job as a CEO is uh, structuring the chaos and and uh, 
um, providing new ways uh, for, for, for the company to grow, bringing up new people and uh, structuring their, their way of work uh, uh, in, uh, in the company. Yeah. Uh, but uh, tell me, when, when hiring people, uh, uh, how much importance do you attribute uh, to, to the attitude versus uh, to the competence? Well, uh, I think uh, both of these are like a, a must, so you can't, you know, give away one of them. You have to, you must have both of these. So, uh, um, in in the beginning, we were sort of forgetting about the uh, about the you know the culture of the values that we, that we want to bring in, and um, so we were only hiring for talent, and we had like super great people, but they they were not like the best you know fit. I, I don't say they. I don't want to say that they were not correct for the company, just we had different understandings of the company. Um, so we had this problem, now I think that I'm leaning towards a, a wrong direction again because I had just a, a few days a job interview uh, with, one, with, uh, with one girl and I, and I started with our values and I went for like half an hour and how we do things and like if you don't do the things that means that you're not fit to this company and that like you, have, you will be fired and she was like sitting like that and, 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 and I, I was emphasizing the way that we have to be learning and it's like we support any kind of like self-improvement that you might have and we expect that you spend your, your time and your efforts on improving and we're gonna like financially support you. Uh, so I said that you have to be like reading books and she was, you know, but if I like I skip a book in a month, I said, no, no, it's the mindset, it's okay if you skip a book. But so. Yeah, so we spend now a lot of um, efforts and a lot of uh, focus on, on culture because it's very important. And, and the, the greatest thing that we want to emphasize is this, is the, is the ownership. We want to, you know, we don't want to put in the control mechanisms. We don't want to say how to do the things. We just want to hire and have smart people that don't need any supervision. And we just want to say that, okay, guys, we're a bunch of... You know, people interested in the same thing, and we are creating one of the probably uh, more successful startups in, in Lithuania. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do because I, if I, if I would know what to do, I wouldn't hire you. So I'm hiring you to do the thing. And uh, so all of our people, they have, uh, you know, they have all control over their like work day uh, on um, vacation schedule. We don't worry when they go to uh, you know on holidays. To, we don't put any budget, so if they think that they have to buy, if they think that they have to spend a thousand euros for self-education, it's their it's their call because it's steam money, and and we expect them to you know that they behave reasonably with money, and uh, so no one ever has to come to me and say that you know can I go for for uh, I don't know for a vacation? Can I go uh, to this conference? Or can I spend? Or can I buy this app? Or you know how much should I spend on marketing? So we talk together, but it's never. It, we always expect everyone to take the the, the reasonable uh, decision uh, that is, you know, in the best interest of, of our company. And and uh, I believe that we now are really going towards that that, that direction. And uh, and I believe that the team really is probably made of, of these smart people who are, uh, you know. You don't have to put any control mechanisms over Yeah, that uh, really sounds like a really uh, empowering uh, culture, like empowering all the, all the employees. So that's, uh, that's a really cool, uh, cool feature, I would say. And uh, I hope you will manage to, as the team grows, you'll manage to, to, to hire the, the proper uh, members uh, for the team and, uh, and, and manage the culture uh, as, it is, as it is now. But uh, maybe now let's uh, um, go to the final stage uh, of uh, of our discussion. And uh, before we uh, we go to the Q and A session, and uh, uh, people, I believe, are already ready with uh, tons of, of questions for you. Uh, I still have uh, some uh, uh, some about um, the trends that that you see. Uh, uh, so you've been working in uh, e-commerce uh, for. 10 years, 10-ish. So uh, what's your take on uh, how the field will, uh, will develop in, uh, in a year, in maybe three years, five years? What, what can you see? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, thing, I think the biggest trend is that the e-commerce is going from, uh, is sort of leaning towards a, a game of smaller entrepreneurs or individuals or solopreneurs. 
uh, it's moving away from the big corporations of the game of of uh, you know huge investments and and, and huge companies to where it's something that uh, you know uh, a student or uh, unemployed person or elders or, or a lot of people are are now started you know they, they just started using e-commerce as a as a way to support themselves or as a way to earn additional money so it's not it doesn't have to be uh, you know a super huge uh, shopping mall online it doesn't have to be you, you, you see a lot of small boutiques online stores and they're doing just fine and making a lot of uh, money at least enough money to sustain uh, yourself or your family so I think this is the um, the greatest shit, uh, the greatest shit, and I think you know the the technology is really uh, enables um, the the e-commerce e or enables the e-commerce to be part a uh, game of uh, of small you know uh, entrepreneurs. So I think this is the this is the, the greatest trend in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then what are your main um lessons learned in in terms of uh, product development what what i heard is that uh, one one is uh, uh, like ship faster and test out the idea as soon as uh, as yes. possible uh, so that's probably the biggest and it was like repeating itself over and over again yeah i think uh, the 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 biggest lesson is that you you shouldn't pretend that you're a smart ass you you have to like read. You have to be one. <laughs> yeah, you have, no, you have to read like the main mistakes. You can write like five top mistakes creating a product, and you're gonna have everything there. And you're gonna if you're like a first time uh, entrepreneur or startup owner or whatever, you're gonna do all these five mistakes. I promise you. So you have to read it and like like cognitively think about these mistakes and not go for it because we did everything. So we have a lot of features. That it took like half a year to, to to develop, and like no one uses it, and it's so frustrating um, to understand it. Like you did it again. Like you, like how many times can you work for a half a year on a feature without showing anyone that feature, and yet again you you, you go and do it again. So I think this is very important when develop when really you know developing a product. Show it very crappy versions of the feature to like a small bunch of uh, of, uh, of your user base. It's, uh, it works, they tell the things and they pull out the, what they want. Um, probably the second thing is uh, also on the top five mistakes list is that you don't have to be always doing exactly the same things that your clients are saying because they, they usually have the, the need but they don't really they always, they don't say the need, they always give you a, a solution and sometimes the solution is not the best way to approach the problem. So I think always thinking about you know what are the actual needs of the customers and what will be their needs in whatever two years time because sometimes they don't know uh, about it. So yeah, I think uh, in terms of product development, that these are two things. Maybe the last thing about the uh, over engineering, but it's, uh, again, it's. I guess it's the same, testing out the, the idea. So you don't have to spend a year developing something and making it perfect, just you, you do it minimal, lovable product, and then you ship it and then see if, if, you're, if you start building on it or not. Do you think it's uh, possible to learn from others' experience? Because uh, it's, you know, it's a textbook mantra that uh, you have to build an MVP and ship it faster. Uh, yeah. Everybody knows it, and it's like yeah, boring stuff. But then, when it comes to actual performance, you do the same mistakes. Yeah, it's exactly what happened to me, and it's exactly what happens to everyone. So you think that like yeah, yeah, like I know better, <laughs> and I'll do it my way, and uh, and uh, you think that you know what they are saying is that like maybe it's a different market, or maybe it's uh, it's different context and different settings and you know poor startups who fail I'm not gonna fail because this is like the thing and I'm like a professional so I'll do it my way but you know it's a I think that's what happened with our ego and with the Celio because uh, this e-commerce business was very successful and we had quite enough money to, to do the things and we thought that we know you know online marketing we, we can drive you know we can sort of acquire people by 
you know, traffic, uh, we know how to build the software and we sat down and we did this and that and went to a startup uh, competition uh, login and, and all sorts of things and it's all irrelevant. Like, you know, there are very tiny things that, that, that are important and you can't skip them. So I think um, these are mistakes that are done always. And sometimes I think the other mistake is that people are not letting their products go. Sometimes you, you are. Sometimes it's very obvious that the thing is not working. If you, even if you have a few hundred customers, you know you you, you think that okay, I spent so much time and it's like I, I let it go. I admit that I'm a, you know I failed and and you, and you don't do that, but. It, what in fact happens is that you're missing on the opportunity that you might have. So maybe if uh, we, with the Celio, okay, we had 400 customers uh, who, who were not paying because we didn't have subscription fee, we had a uh, transaction fee. But so we had 400 customers. For a lot of startups, that would be like, you know, quite a decent number. So we would say, okay, 400, maybe I can bring it to 1,000 and maybe, you know, later to 2,000 and you, and you start, you know, and uh, you know, working on this life for yourself and, 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 and continue working on it, but you know, if we hadn't stopped at, at that time, a burla would never happen, and a burla is like, you know, incomparable to that thing, and thankfully we said, okay, so 400 is not something that we expected, so that is a failure, let's move on, let's, let's try something else, because, you know, when, when you build Facebook or Spotify or something, it, you, it never you know, it, it just, I think, you see the traction, you, you see the love of the first users uh, to the product, they, you know, they, they use it and they like it. And it's not that you have to, you know, very hard try to push it or, or sell it. I think if it solves a problem, it solves a problem and people love it from the very beginning. Okay, uh, you mentioned you have uh, two locations, uh, two offices. Uh, so one is here in, uh, in Tech Park and the other is... Yeah, so the other is just, um, we just started, uh, started rolling out an office in Berlin. Uh, it just happened, uh, well, in fact, uh, two weeks ago when our uh, developers went there. Uh, so we have our current developers working from Berlin. Uh, we have CTO in Berlin. Uh, we have recruiter in Berlin because we are <laughs> hiring people in Berlin. Uh, and now uh, my brother moved there, so that's why he couldn't participate in this event. Um, yeah, so we, we expect to build um, at least one product team there, uh, to build marketing team there, uh, or further marketing team because we, we have some guys here. And um, most likely, uh, most of the senior hires will be working from Berlin because it is, it's sometimes a little bit of a problem to attract them to Illness. Uh, so why Berlin? Okay, Berlin is very close to Lithuania, as you might know. Uh, the time difference is one hour. Uh, it's a very uh, international city, so you can uh, find uh, all nationalities. It's easy to attract other people to Berlin. So we, uh, now we are hiring one guy from Italy who's, who was going to be moving to Berlin. Uh, there, um, our CTO has a lot of experience hiring people from South America. Um, so it's a very attractive place. It's uh, one of the greatest European tech hubs. Uh, you have a lot of, you know, the infrastructure, the, the community. You have, you know, SoundCloud and other startups who uh, rock the internet who, uh, who are doing a good job in, in, in uh, you know, educating or, or raising the, the whole community. Uh, so it's very attractive and it's relatively cheap. So it's not much more expensive than, uh, than Vilnius. Uh, so in terms of you know, living costs in terms of salaries, in terms of office rent, it's, it's sort of the same. Well, a bit, a bit higher, but not, uh, not, not that much. Maybe like 20, 25 percent. So it's, uh, you know, you get all the goodness of, you know, a global tech hub uh, for a fraction of price that you would pay in London or that you would pay in Silicon Valley. So it's very, very attractive. Uh, so uh, we we see this uh, maybe. Um Second company, at least second company that's that's moving there. It's it's Vinted mm -hmm. uh, that are opening their their office there as well. So uh, the main competence that is missing here in Lithuania that exists in in, in Berlin. Or uh, I think um, the, the the thing is 
with Vilnius is that we have a lot of good quality people, and I think across the the you know the the domain. So we have a lot of good developers and a lot of um, decent marketing guys. Uh, um, you know the English of the English language of the things are pretty good. So I think the the customer success teams are fine here. The problem is with the experience because we don't have like you know Shopify or Spotify or Facebook or Google or other huge companies, and you don't have a place where you can really get that experience. And you know you have Adform and you have Vinted, but that's you know pretty much it. And and still, I mean, they are struggling with the talent. So I think it's very good to 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 get the uh, you know all the working force, but if you want to attract like a really senior people with a lot of experience in in huge international startups with thousands of people, you can't do that in Lithuania. We don't we don't have these people, well a few, uh, and it's very difficult to attract them to Lithuania. So we talked about re, uh, we talked with a few guys about relocation to Vilnius, and uh, and you know it, it didn't sound too appealing for them. So it's just easier because it's you know relatively cheap or uh, the, the cost is sort of the same in Berlin, so it's so much easier to go there and you have more people there and you can easily attract people there. So that's why. Yeah. But uh, do you think in, um, let's say, five years time, uh, since uh, we really have uh, uh, quite a few uh, successful startups picking up uh, the, the, the pace, do you think in, in some five years time we're going to have this uh, uh, senior uh, senior level competence here here in Lithuania. Do you think it's gonna you know the the, the knowledge will come here the, on a spillover effects from uh, from this uh, couple of companies that that are really scoring it big? Yeah, uh, I think uh, I think it definitely improved. I mean, it it is improving right now, and it's it's definitely gonna get better uh, with the time. I think uh, another thing that we are missing is we don't have a lot of like big exits or success stories with the you know liquidation event at the end like Estonia with the Skype so you know it's also difficult to talk with the foreign investors and say that you know it's like you know we can do everything right here they are they are still considering you know Eastern Europe as something that maybe they don't know that much about the system about the, the community about the legal uh, system and, and they don't feel that comfortable uh, moving in here so I think that the talent will uh, definitely, uh, you know, improve, and and uh, I think that the overall image of Vilnius will reach other people because it, I think uh, well, we had the CTO coming to Vilnius, and he was pretty amazed, how, you know, how how Vilnius looked, and he said like, wow, this looks like Berlin. It's like you know, like a normal city, <laughs> and a lot of people would think that you know we are living in some sort of Stone Age or in the forest in Eastern Europe where. But, I don't know, like factory, old, like abandoned factory in the city center. I don't know, but uh, it's definitely a, a little uh, problem that we have to communicate that Vilnius is a modern, modern city with a lot of you know uh, tech startups and uh, and vivid community, uh, uh, and it's uh, it's awesome to like the nightlife and everything. It's very attractive, and uh, and the cost of living is very attractive. And you're like in in more in. European Union than in post-Soviet bloc. I think that's uh, that's that's the message. That's the message. Okay, so I think uh, let's take this uh, uh, the as next uh, yeah as a um, suggestion to, to promote Vilnius and, and Lithuania uh, among our international uh, friends, so that uh, uh, it's going to be easier to to attract uh, talent to Lithuania. And uh, I would like to end our discussion here and uh, open the stage and open the mic for, uh, for your questions. So uh, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, we'll hand a microphone for you and, uh, and you may ask. My question is, during these eight or ten years of hustle and ups and downs, there must be sh some, let's say, innovation who kept the fire burning inside. So my question is, was it, let's say, 100% inside motivation or you have some external motivation like books, stories or people? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, again, a lot of things that, that, a lot of lies that you say to yourself that like this time is going to happen. So uh, it's a little bit of lying to yourself and you definitely have to have support around you. So if, like, uh, you know, if everyone around you is going to, say that you're like, you know, there, there is no way you're going to do that, then I think 
it's it's going to be too difficult. It, it, of course, it depends on you know when you actually you know get to to that success. But maybe if it takes eight years and everyone around you is saying that like no way you're going to do that, then maybe it, it's going to be difficult. And then I think a lot of external motivations like I don't know books and and uh, you know movies, uh, documentaries about people. Um, and especially seeing that like none of them were successful in the very beginning. You take Elon Musk, he was uh, cleaning the, the, I don't know how that's in English, the, the pipes, the, the waste pipes, the canalizati? No, waste pipes, yeah. Oh, whatever. Sewers. Sewers, sewers. Yeah, you know, it, it, like everyone started somewhere and it takes time until you, you get to, to be successful. And again, I don't know if we will be successful, so that's why we were pretty quiet for a year. We, well, we were quiet for a year because we were, you know, very much focused on the product. But on the other hand, I don't want to be going here and shouting that we are very successful because if we, you know, run into a wall in two months, then everyone's going to be laughing at you. So it's like, uh, I don't think that we secured this success. You know, it's it, it's very fast moving thing and very fragile, fragile thing. and. Mm, yeah, so, um, yeah, long story short, a lot of external in, uh, in motivation factors and a lot of internal, a lot of internal. You have to be always lying to yourself, like, you know, it's like gonna end one day. <laughs> I think psychologists have this term uh, motivational illusion. You put a motivational illusion for yourself, you just draw a picture, uh, you know, like uh, you hang it like a carrot and you run, 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 run. And um, you just, yeah, you fool yourself into it. Yeah, I have to say uh, one instance uh, how I fooled myself. So when I, when I opened this first e-commerce business, I thought that I'm a businessman and I have to wear a suit and I have to have an office. So I rented an office and I wear the suit and, and I was alone in that office for a year. And I would always come this morning and say hello to myself and I sit to the table with a, with a, with a nice suit and a computer. And I would stay there for a year. Yeah, true, a true <laughs> businessman. Okay. Yeah, because that's how you, you know, say that. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm, I'm doing business. I'm the owner of the business. I wear a suit and I have an office. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very cool. Okay. Next question, please. Yeah. So, uh, why did you sell the very successful company, and are you gonna sell this one too? Or okay. Baby? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the thing is that. That successful, com that successful business became not very successful after six or seven months, because uh, we were fully relying on uh, on um, Facebook advertising channels. So it was a stupid thing to do, but we were putting all our eggs into one basket. We were getting all of our all, all of our you know traffic from one from one source, and they changed their algorithm, which usually usually happens with. Uh, you know, when you're relying on one uh, marketing channel. So with, uh, they changed the algorithm and our our sales started declining. So we, it wasn't, we couldn't uh, expand our budget. So it was still very effective, but we couldn't, we could spend uh, like very small amounts. And before the algorithm changed, we were spending like four to five thousand dollars a day on marketing. And after the change, we could, you know, spend like a couple of hundreds and that was, end of the story so we found people who were interested in, in, in buying the business and unfortunately um, when we uh, we started working with the brokers in, in, in the states and when we listed the company for sale uh, it was you know the financial um, indicators the, the financial uh, measure KPIs were still pretty good so it was a pretty high amount of uh, you know of, of that deal, uh, but in the period uh, from when we listed the company to the, to when we sold it, the price dropped ten times. So it's um, it wasn't a very successful exit, but it was pretty funny. I mean, uh, yeah. So uh, and the, the the second question, if we're gonna sell this, so um, um, this is a very difficult question. We, uh, I think, statistically thinking, we will probably sell it one day, but it very much depends on how it, uh, you know, rolls out. So if you still have ideas and you still see the future for it, you don't want to sell it unless, like, if someone offers you like insane money that you could, I don't know, do 
way more important things, but I don't think that uh, very often happens. So, um, you, you know, if you still have vision going, you still have ideas and, 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 and you know, plans for it, then, then we would not sell. Um, but again, that very much depends. If someone would come today and, and say, like, we're going to buy it, then we wouldn't sell. But I don't know what, what's going to happen after five years, so it's difficult to say right now. Is there a company doing well now? The, uh, which one? The one you sold. Uh, yeah, it's still rolling. They're still generating. Not, I don't think they're making that much, but they're still alive. And they, actually, they're partly our clients right now. And a lot of our competitors started and became our clients right now. Yeah. Okay, so after these eight years of experience, uh, struggling and success, if you have to start over tomorrow with nothing, so where would you find people to collaborate with to start war? Like you said, people are in the sewer, maybe. So yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good question and it's a very important question. So I think um, uh, when you start a business, you usually think, okay, so uh, like I'm gonna, um, you know, I need to have money to hire people and uh, like an office and something. But if you have a good idea and uh, if you find the right people, they, they are usually fine, uh, you know, doing the first steps, the first MVPs, the first, you know, versions of the product for free or, uh, you know, out of, out of the idea. Uh, so, uh, important thing is that you offer and you give away a lot of equity in the very beginning for the other co-founders. Uh, that's how you keep them motivated. And I think in the very beginning, it's important that you don't like quit everything, quit your day job, uh, unless you have like tons of money in deep pockets. But uh, you shouldn't do that, and then you should do this on your spare time with your friends and, and see, you know, start testing out the different things. Don't quit everything and don't start working on one project. You know, do a lot of small things, test, and if you see the traction, then you will know. I mean, you're just going to know when it happens. You, you're going to see the people asking for more fe uh, you know, features. They, they will start talking and they will be, you know, bombarding you with the emails, and that's, that's when the things happen. And you can, you know, perfectly... Uh, well do this without having an office and without hiring anything and doing on this you know on a, on a free time so I think it's a very lean way to to go and uh, to you know as a matter of fact um, this is more uh, becoming more and more popular because in in the old days when uh, you had an idea you could go to the investor and show the idea and sometimes they would fund you now uh, after uh, you know a, a few difficult years People say that, okay, so if you have something that cool, that means show me that you can attract people, show me that you can attract customers, and show me that you can generate a little bit of revenues. And if you have a, you know, a, little, a little thing working, then I'm going to give you money, and then you can take that thing and like, you know, multiply success and, and, uh, and go broader. So I, I really think that in the very beginning, forget about funding, forget about investments, forget about... Um, you know, startup pitch offs and, and all these events, you don't have to, it doesn't matter. You, like, you don't have to surprise your, you know, your peers in startups. You have to surprise your customers. So, just like really think about the unique problem that exists, find people who would be interested, do this on free time, test the, test the market, and, uh, and, uh, and I think this is the way to go. And uh, we were talking with the co founders that if we fail again, this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to have the team and we will put the team to create, let's say, five or seven small products that solve some specific problem and then we're going to launch it. And if one of these products, you know, you know, gets some significant traction, then we're going to work on that. And I think this is really a lean and, and, and smart way to approach the, the startups. Hi, my name is Omar. Can you share with us like uh, how you can acquire more customers, uh, which marketing channels you use most, like uh, most famous, or uh, can you suggest us like we have a newly company in wellness. Basically, we have a company in the UK 16 years ago, so we move, uh, open a new branch in um, wellness also. It's related to networking and IT business. Yeah. So we are a uh, authorized partner of Cisco uh, and Juniper. So your marketing channels, or can you suggest something? Yeah, so now we are, uh, we are all over the place with the marketing channels. Uh, we sort of, uh, we are in, in this experimentation phase where we want to know exactly what we can achieve in every single, not every single, but most of the popular marketing channels. So we do the basic stuff, so, you know, content marketing, SEO, uh, direct advertising, AdWords, affiliate networks, partnerships, everything that you can imagine, and then you just, you know, 
uh, inject small amount of money into every uh, channel and see you know if it plays out and if you can start working. So that's a very basic approach. The second approach that our guys uh, are uh, are doing, they are looking for for different ways or more creative ways to attract. So uh, you know, uh, creating a lot of uh, free content and ebooks and then you know um, a lot of online courses and, and and webinars and then more interesting partnerships. Um, I'm not sure if I can um, give you all my all our tricks. <laughs> But uh, we have a few, but it's really, you know, the first step is do the, the, you know, the basics. So I think you have to think about the, if it's, if it applies to you, the SEO and, and the content and then some, some direct advertising, but then you have to think, okay, how, uh, where, first of all, who are my customers? Where do they usually gather and what? interesting attractive ways to, 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 to approach that. So if that would, wouldn't be on live, I would tell you a few of the stories. I will tell you afterwards, but I don't want to say this to everyone. <laughs> okay, do we have uh, any more questions? So for now you're uh, doing this platform for uh, Shopify, yes? And what about the other uh, um, channels? Yeah. Uh, so uh, in the very beginning, it was created for Shopify. Um, uh, so now we are working on other e-commerce platforms, but uh, we felt in love with Shopify, with their, you know, with their team, with their, um, with their community, with their app developers, with their support. So we really like them, and uh, it just like feels so counterintuitive to move away from someone that you so much love. <laughs> So, um, so uh, we are thinking about this, uh, but we don't like we don't want to run. We have a good relation. We trust these guys. They trust us. We solve their problem. They solve our problem. And we are we have uh, you know uh, created uh, landing pages on Shopify with them. We are we have uh, marketing campaigns running together with them. You know we are talking about integrations with them. So uh, there are like no need, no real need to go to other platforms. So um, probably as a test, we're going to do that, but, uh, but we are super happy with Shopify. And in fact, um, that's another thing maybe to your question is that you can always tap into an existing marketing uh, you know, platform or, or channel or something that, or medium that generates you a lot of traffic. So what happened uh, for us is that we put our app to the uh, Shopify app store and it was one of the kind at that time. And, uh, uh, we got a lot of initial customers from that, and the same thing happens, you know, for for Apple Store and for other stores. So if you can find some, you know, some place where you can already, you know, use the potential, uh, that's uh, that's a good way to start. And uh, for a, a lot of startups, new uh, uh, people who want to do some product, I would say I would definitely recommend to check out Shopify App Store. They they have a very active uh, uh, community. They are paying out, I think, like. 15 or something million dollars to app store developers every month. So uh, I think a lot of you know, a lot of um, things happening there. Hi, uh, I have a question about the very first steps of uh, testing your uh, new product. Uh, you mentioned that you try the very crappy version of your, the first version of your product. So could you please specify the exact level of crappiness of that product. <laughs> so, okay, so I think that you have to answer what is the thing that it has to, you know, do, it has to solve. So for, in our, uh, for our, uh, you know, taking our example, it was people, um, because people didn't want to buy the products, they were sort of going to AliExpress and like manually copying the things and putting it in, in uh, copying the information of the product and putting that information to their store and uh, it was a manual thing uh, you know that that's kind of over overcame the problem of product sourcing and having to buy the things in, in advance so they were doing this manual thing and then we created the script which simply scraped the, the AliExpress page and imported that so it was the thing that any developer could do in two hours it's a super easy thing to do so uh, the 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 initial app was basically one thing. So I don't think we like. I think we had login and uh, money collection, and we had. So it's not working at all, or is it? 
So okay, so we had uh, this basic function. We had login form, and I think I don't think we had much of other stuff. And then people started using it because it was the thing that solved the problem. And then they said, look, but if I you know import the product, I would like no when the price changes or the stock changes. So we put down and then you have like, you know, something that sinks, then they said, okay, but then I sell the product. I wanna like, I wanna place that product on AliExpress so I don't have to like manually do this. So we put on that and then they said, like I'm getting so much, so many orders every day that I can't do it alone. So I, I need users. So we created like user accounts and then they said, okay, but like if I'm getting 400 orders per day, then I need to know you know how many of these orders were like actually shipped? So we created a, a, a like a shipment tracking system, and it grows organically. So instead of your like imagination that you're going to change the world and create this visionary product and and do this everything uh, all all these small things, you basically create the the core solution to the problem, and then you build on top of it. So even if you think you know Gmail was an email platform, it did one thing right, send the emails and give you, you know, unlimited space, that's all you needed. And then they, they, they took, you know, 10 years to build a lot of services on top of that. But in the very beginning, it was one thing, and it's still one thing, you go there for emails. So I think, uh, really think, extract what is the core proposition, what you do, and then you think, and then you listen if people like, then they will gonna, they're gonna tell you what they want. Okay, one question from a business point of view, if you, uh, you, you created a great app which solves a lot of problems uh, and uh, this app helps people to sell cheap products more expensive. So what's uh, the problem you solve just for people who are buying these things? Okay, so uh, the thing is that you're taking the AliExpress example. So this is to some extent true that, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, AliExpress is a, is a is a place where you where you, where the end user can go and buy the product. Uh, the problem with AliExpress is that you can't imagine how many fraud schemes there are, how many times you, you're not getting a, a product. And I think they they uh, did the investigation some time ago where they said that around 50% of of uh, of the products that are going through AliExpress are counterfeit or or, or poor quality products. So that is the problem that exists in the market, and uh, we, first of all, came to the market uh, and dropshipping market. We got all the customers who are using these uh, the, the the current system that doesn't exist any better, and now we are we created our own marketplace with a verified supplier. So we know uh, everyone by name, all the suppliers. We have their documents. We have agreements with them. We have escrow funds. So if something happens, if your customer is getting like a broken thing, we're gonna cover all the costs. So AliExpress is not created for that, and it, and the 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 thing that a lot of people are using it for this reason is that there are no solutions, and the Verlo is is a is a thing is the first thing that is solely created for that. So uh, in our marketplace, we are we are creating a lot of different value propositions, a lot of things where we put in value in the, in the whole infrastructure. And uh, AliExpress, uh, for the marketplace, uh, I have to tell uh, very briefly that in the marketplace you always have this problem where you, you know, you can't have buyers in your marketplace if you don't have sellers. And if you don't have sellers, then, you know, you can't attract buyers, so you have this vacuum of, you know, cut, you know supply and demand and you can't solve it. So the way we solved it was, we plugged the submarket, AliExpress, in the very beginning, and, and all of a sudden we have through one channel we had all all these products in, in China. So we can offer you know escrow funds and guarantees and everything, but we have the full catalog. And with that catalog and automation tools, we managed to attract you know over 10, uh, 10,000 retailers. And now that we have ten thousand retailers, we can think, okay, so what are the like the real service uh, services that we can bring to this ecosystem? So that's how it uh, moved away. So it's a good question, and uh, yeah, we 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 are we are working on the solutions that are really going to change the e-commerce and, and drop shipping in, in China, uh, working with Chinese suppliers. Okay, so we have uh, time for one last question. Okay, so it's a dual question; but they do not relate. Uh, one is. Uh, what was the most important lesson you learned throughout those eight years of trial and error? 
if you could specify one. Um, I would say that uh, the, the greatest problem was that I was making, uh, or we were making the same mistakes like over and over and over again. It was exactly the same from the, the first venture that I did to the second, and I couldn't like, it was difficult for me to, you know, to, to hold my excitement when I got this new idea, and I always, and, and like my, the smart part of me started saying like, you know, but maybe, you know, you have to find like a plan, how are you gonna get the customers, but the naive part of me says like, wow, I just like wanna work on this idea. So uh, I, I did that like so many times in a row, and always exactly the same. You build a, a perfect product and like nothing happens when you launch it. So it's, it, it, I think this is like the greatest thing. If you, if you did a mistake, like you're pretty stupid if you do the same mistake or not, you know, let alone if you do it like six or seven times exactly the same thing. And, and then you start like, uh, the seventh time you're still very cheerful and think like, wow, like I'm gonna go for this idea. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah. All right. Um, how did your wife stay with you for that long? <laughs> well, she's a very patient um, person, or I'm a good liar. <laughs> I don't know what's the, what's the reason, but um, yeah, I don't know. Well, we have a, a child, we have two children, so maybe that also contributed, <laughs> because it wasn't that easy, just like that. Um, yeah, uh, but I think uh, it's important to have the right you know, person behind you uh, when, when, you're, when you're doing stupid things. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks everybody for, for your attention and for your time. Uh, I hope you had a, a good time uh, listening to uh, Andrus and uh, let's give him a nice round of applause.